Hi everyone, and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing quite a comprehensive video on Brook Farm, or we might want to call it the Brook Farm Experiment. I wanted to do my definitive video on the subject, as it sits at the intersection between many areas of interest of mine. Uh, 19th century New England intellectual life, uh, to some degree religious experimentation, the founder George Ripley was a former Unitarian minister, as I am. Uh, the experiment was about exploring new ways of being or new ways of living in the world, uh, part of the utopianism trend that was sweeping through America at the time. There's certainly a political dimension to this. Brook Farm can be understood as a proto-socialist or proto-communist experiment, which uh, predated both uh, Marx's Das Kapital and the communist revolution in Russia. Um, there's the philosophical underpinnings of the experiment, which I'll explore. And then there's the individuals themselves, those who participated in the experiment. Brook Farm is located outside of Boston, about 30 minutes drive from the town centre, nestled in what is today Boston's suburbia. When the experiment began in the early 1840s, the area was far more rural. Accessing the farm by way of horse and cart, which would have been the preferred method at the time, would have taken one to two hours from the city centre. The Brook Farm experiment was, as I said, part of this 19th century utopianism trend in the United States. These were experimentations around communal living and the enacting of different kinds of social structures. These experiments often had a strong religious component, a desire to either return to the kind of communal living that we see the apostles engaging in, in the book of Acts, or more radically, an attempt to return to a kind of harmonic Garden of Eden type of lifestyle. Although Brook Farm did have a religious component to it, it is probably the most secular of such experiments at the time. Okay, so to further set the scene, uh, let's explore the life of Brook Farm's founder, visionary, and leader, George Ripley. At the insistence of his Unitarian father, George Ripley went to Harvard College, before going on to train for the ministry at Harvard Divinity School, which was, at the time, dominated by Unitarianism. In 1826, he then took up a position as a Unitarian minister in Boston. The next 10 years of ministry, which followed, were pretty uneventful, until 1836, when he published an article, Schleiermacher as a Theologian, in the Christian Examiner. Um, I'll come back to this slide. To understand the uh, intellectual climate in the run-up to the establishment of Brook Farm, it's important to understand the challenges which were taking place in New England intellectual life at the time, specifically within the Unitarian Church. 19th century Unitarianism was a liberal Christian denomination which valued uh, rationality, liberty, and rejected uh, orthodox Christian doctrines such as the Trinity and original sin. It was largely an affluent, intellectual, northeastern-based denomination. Within Unitarianism, the goalposts were shifting. We could say um, one man's liberalism is another man's conservatism. Early 19th century Unitarianism is best captured in a sermon that was delivered by William Ellery Channing. Uh, this is a later portrait of Channing. Uh, the sermon, which was his 1819 Baltimore sermon, preached at the ordination of Jared Sparks, was the kind of um, defining um, document or defining sermon of what Unitarianism was at the time. It was written to kind of push back against the criticism being thrown their way by other Christian denominations, most notably by the Calvinists. Whereas the god of Calvin was a wrathful, vengeful god in need of being appeased, the god of Unitarianism was gentle and loving. The Bible is being understood for Channing through an unorthodox lens, of course, but it is still being understood more or less at face value. 
when it says such and such a miracle occurred in this way, uh, that is being accepted by uh, Channing and his Unitarian contemporaries as true. He outlines the doctrinal positions of Unitarianism, the oneness of God, the humanity of Jesus. Uh, he highlights the importance of virtue within the Christian life. Um, in a nutshell, this is early 19th century Unitarianism. Unitarianism juxtaposed against Calvinism. As we get deeper into the 19th century, however, we increasingly have the kind of mostly Germanic school of biblical criticism beginning to have its bearing on the conversation within Unitarian intellectual life. With this, traditional interpretations of the Bible were being questioned. Reason is being applied to the scriptures. Efforts to understand the text within its historical context are being made, alongside, um, you know, an attempt to kind of understand the Bible in philosophical terms is also being made. Okay, so that brings us back to George Ripley. Ten years of ministry under his belt, he writes his paper on Schleiermacher, very much a German within this new school of biblical criticism. For Schleiermacher, the unseating of traditional interpretation of doctrine and the centrality of miracles led to a, a nuanced approach as to how one should now understand the Bible, shifting the emphasis towards inward truths and the importance of our own intuition. These were the ideas that were being highlighted by Ripley in his paper. There was a danger that Schleiermacher was responding to, which was echoed by Ripley, that an overly uh, academic or overly scientific approach to the scriptures would rob them of their import. Instead, what was needed was a harmonization between our experience on one hand and academic rigor on the other, or between the kind of mindless superstitions of our yesteryears and the kind of shallow rationalism of today. And what would emerge from this harmony, according to Ripley, was a higher life, greater beauty, a kind of divine energy. Um, with beliefs like this, I think we can begin to see, um, you know, why Ripley, this romantic, this idealist, was undoubtedly a man who could sell people on a vision. Okay, I'm kind of jumping back and forth here, but back to this other slide. Um, probably the centralmost figure within the changing tides of Unitarianism was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, this is a later image of Emerson. Uh, Emerson was a Unitarian minister. Uh, he, he at least started out that way, but he resigned in 1832 from his post, uncomfortable with the traditional religious practices um, that he was required to do, uh, and he gradually moved away from a kind of doctrinal understanding um, of his faith towards philosophical concerns. Uh, this is a, a bit of a simplification, but he, he kind of moved away from liberal Christianity and towards a kind of nature-based um, or religious perennialism. The idea being that within nature or at the roots of every religious system, uh, there are universal truths that we can identify and align ourselves with. So within Unitarianism um, and around Emerson specifically, this kind of mode of thinking was termed transcendentalism. Uh, like many religious labels, it was originally a pejorative term, transcendentalism, transcendentalists, to transcend uh, this physical world and attain some higher spiritual state. There's a kind of up in the air quality uh, to it, lofty ideas of little concrete value. But the name was ultimately reappropriated by the proponents of these ideas. Um, that somewhere within our subjective experience, there is a deeper, um, there are deeper, more fundamental truths. Uh, truths which transcend the kind of um, squabbles that denominations engage in with one another. Emerson is seen as the father of this movement, so much so that we could use a term like Emersonian um, or Emersonianism, um, and we'd basically be talking about the same thing. 
Uh, the first Transcendentalist meeting was actually organised, however, by George Ripley. The Transcendental Club was formed in 1836. It was uh, Transcendentalist principles uh, and many individuals that were involved in the Transcendentalist movement that helped establish the farm. Uh, this was the foundational philosophical underpinning for the Brook Farm experiment. Uh, it was the Panic of 1837 uh, which resulted in the end of George Ripley's ministry, his ministry as a Unitarian. The Panic of 1837 was a financial crisis in the United States. Profits, prices and wages dropped. Many were criticising social institutions. Uh, George Ripley joined in this criticism, uh, criticising the American state for its love and pursuit of wealth above all else. Um, he upset his trustees. Uh, they wanted him to avoid political and controversial topics. Uh, he, of course, protested, uh, saying that he should be able to speak his own mind. Uh, he sent a letter of resignation in May of 1840, but was convinced to stay uh, and then resigned proper in October 1840. Um, he departed by uh, giving his congregation a 10-minute lecture on all the problems with Unitarianism. Ultimately, for George Ripley, there were two philosophical influences. On one hand, Transcendentalism, and on the other, the ideas of Charles Foyer, um, which is to say, proto-communist ideas, um, those being espoused by the American Union of Associationists. This movement uh, advanced the ideas of Charles Foyer, hence the American Associationists, also being called the Foyerism Society. In the course of the Brook Farm experiment, Foyerism became the more dominant of the two philosophies. Though it's not exactly clear when the Foyerist philosophy entered the picture. Probably from the experiment's conception, there were some, probably Ripley himself, that were familiar with the philosophy, and those ideas were, from that point on, beginning to gain traction. So this American Foyerism movement came into existence with the publication of The Social Destiny of Man by Albert Brisbane in 1840. The book begins with this paragraph. The object which I have in view in publishing this volume is to lay before the American public the profound and original conceptions of Charles Foyer on the subject of the reorganization of society. What follows is a 500-page manifesto outlining Foyerism and the ideas which would capture the imagination of American intellectuals for about a decade. For George Ripley, Foyerism never fully supplanted Transcendentalism, but the philosophical emphasis um, within the Brook Farm experiment certainly shifted in that direction. So here is a brief summary of um, Foyerism. It was a Christian movement, the idea being that there was this divine social order and that humanity was destined or, or fated to ultimately bring ourselves into alignment with this divine social order. Um, it's all about um, kind of forging a new social harmony, a harmony he believed that could be achieved if we were to live in these small communities. So it's a form of communism, but not a national uh, forced economy communism, but a localized form of communism. Uh, communism achieved the level of community. Small, self-sustaining, self-governing community. He put a strong emphasis on education. Not an education which is designed to turn individuals into useful cogs within the economy, but rather an education which would be tailored to the inherent passions of each individual. And according to the inherent passions of each individual, they would in turn group themselves up accordingly. Farmers together, artisans together, uh, industrial producers together, and so forth. 
And being grouped up in this way um, in communities of like-minded individuals that shared in their passions, um, they would be able to increase in productivity together. That's the idea. Um, these groups would then in turn trade with one another and with other foyer groups and a kind of harmonious network would emerge across the globe ultimately. There would be no wage labour, rather everyone within one community would share in the communal fruits of that community. And for foyer um, there is no need for a hierarchy that kind of sits beyond this, um, beyond the community or above the community. There's no government, there's no nation state overseeing things. Um, there's only the harmonious interplay between these individual communities. Um, these communities were termed phalanxes. Uh, phalanxes being the kind of tight uh, rectangular military formations um, from ancient Greek warfare. Um, the sense being invoked is obvious. A tight formation, uh, reliant upon each other, every individual being critical to the success of the whole. Between the year 1843 and 1845, uh, over 16, maybe as many as 30 phalanxes of this kind would be established in the United States. Brook Farm, um, which had already been established, declared itself to be a phalanx in 1844. Albert Brisbane, the American proponent of uh, foyerism uh, and the author of the book, um, was the obvious leader of the movement, quickly gaining traction. Brisbane, however, was, it turned out, allergic to power and responsibility. Um, and as the pressure mounted, he simply left for France to pursue other academic interests. Ultimately, the movement would not survive his departure. Okay, I think that's enough background. Um, now we'll get on to the Brook Farm experiment itself. Uh, Brook Farm is noted um, as one of the most famous 19th century utopian communities in America, founded in 1841. George Ripley and his wife, Sophia Dana, formed a joint stock company with 10 other uh, initial investors. Um, one of which was notably the American author Nathaniel Hawthorne. In 1844, Brook Farm, as I said, transitioned to a foyerism model, uh, and this introduced more uh, structure to the community uh, as they organized themselves around the ideas of Charles Foyer. Uh, and this is when, as I said, they declared themselves to be a phalanx. The Foyerism philosophy uh, that was being introduced to America uh, sparked the establishment of numerous such communities. Um, the Brook Farm was um, an early adopter, however. Um, the shift from transcendentalism focus to Foyerism um, meant a shift away from the kind of focus on the individual, the flourishing of um, the individual towards a focus on the community. Um, the farm, as a result, became more structured, more organized. Um, there was a ideological shift and a resulting tension that emerged from this shift. There were class tensions in particular between middle class members and working class individuals who joined later. Um, and this was further exacerbated by the shift. In keeping with the Foyerism theory, they attempted to build a large communal building which would act as the hub of the community. Uh, the community took on debt in order to try and build this building. There was a fire, um, you know, destroying some of the early construction of the building. And it was probably the building project itself, in large part, that led to the demise of Brook Farm. Despite the official shift to foyerism, uh, elements of transcendentalism persisted within the community, um, influencing social practices and values. And the dispersed housing um, kind of represents that there was an incomplete transition towards foyerism. 
um, suggests a kind of blend remained between transcendentalist thought and the Feuerist influences. Uh, there was a school in the community which uh, exemplified the community's egalitarian aspirations, offering education to children regardless of their social and financial background, uh, aiming for a holistic development uh, that combined mental uh, and manual labor. Ultimately, there was a disconnect, I think, or this is you know, what led ultimately to the demise. There was a disconnect between the idealistic aspirations and the practical challenges of implementing uh, such a radical uh, social experiment. The community's efforts to integrate working class members in particular proved challenging alongside what were ostensibly New England academics. While George Ripley was the linchpin of the Brook Farm experiment, um, it attracted a constellation of intellectual stars of the era, um, each adding their own unique hue to the tapestry of the utopian community. One cannot speak of the Brook Farm experiment without mentioning Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, who was, as I said, an initial investor and resident, um, albeit briefly. Uh, Hawthorne's scepticism towards the viability of communal living, combined with his personal discomfort with the farm's manual labour, uh, led to his departure. However, his experience on Brook Farm inspired um, a portion of his novel, um, The Blythedale Romance, offering a critical, if uh, somewhat fictionalised, perspective on the experiment. Margaret Fuller, a journalist, critic, and women's right advocate, was another luminary uh, drawn to the farm. Um, although not a resident, her visits uh, and interactions with the community influenced her thinking and writing. Uh, Fuller's transcendentalist leanings and advocacy for women's independence found resonance um, with the farm's ideals, and her presence underscored the experiment's role as a hub for progressive thought. And then there is Henry David Thoreau, who, while never a member, visited Brook Farm and observed its operations. Thoreau's transcendentalist philosophy and later experiment in simple living at Walden Pond were likely influenced by his observations of communal life at Brook Farm. His critical eye provided valuable external perspectives on the strengths and weaknesses of such utopian experiments. These figures, among others, were not mere participants, but active contributors to the intellectual ferment at Brook Farm. Their involvement underscored the experiment's magnetic pull on those grappling with the era's um, pressures, social, philosophical, and spiritual questions. The interplay of their ideas with the fabric of Brook Farm created a vibrant, if not transient, cultural and intellectual ecosystem. Okay, as we draw our exploration of Brook Farm to a close, it's important we consider the ripples that this experiment sent through the fabric of American society. Uh, though Brook Farm itself lasted a mere uh, six years, the echoes of its ideals, struggles, and communal spirit continue to resonate shedding light on the perennial human quest for harmony, equality, and a deeper connection with the essence of life. The legacy of Brook Farm is multifaceted. In the immediate aftermath, it might have seemed like a tale of ambition that flew too close to the sun, only to be singed by the harsh realities of life. Yet, the very audacity of its vision laid down a marker for future generations, illustrating both the potential and the pitfalls of striving for such alternative ways of being in this world. In the realm of education, Brook Farm's uh, innovative approach, blending intellectual, manual, and artistic labor, left an indelible mark. It kind of prefigures the progressive education movement that would uh, later take root, championing the ideas that learning should be holistic, joyous, and tailored to each individual's innate passions and abilities. Socially and politically, Brook Farm's experiment in communal living and shared labor uh, anticipated the cooperative movement that would emerge in the late 19th and 20th century. 
it served as a tangible example of how people could come together, breaking down barriers of class and convention to forge a community based on mutual respect, shared work, and collective well-being. Philosophically, Brook Farm stood as a testament to the transcendental beliefs in the uh, inherent goodness of individuals and the possibility of achieving a higher state of existence. While the community may not have sustained itself in the long term, uh, its underlying ideals continue to inspire those seeking to transcend the materialism and the individualism um, of today's mainstream society. Ultimately, uh, Brook Farm's greatest legacy may be its enduring invitation to dream, the audacity to think well outside the box. I think that's what I find most interesting about the experiment. The whole thing is mad, um, and it's no surprise to me that it failed dramatically. Um, I think communal living of this nature would be hell. It certainly would not chime with my uh, introverted nature. Um, I am, of course, or maybe not of course, but I am no proponent of socialism or communism um, or anything of the sort. Um, but at the same time, uh, these individuals dared to try something pretty mad. And I find that pretty, um, pretty interesting, pretty engaging. Um, instead of being uh, ossified in their cynicism, um, as most of us so often are, they actually did something. They dared to make their vision a reality, um, even in the face of such daunting challenges. Okay, and that's it. So on that note, um, I'll say thank you for watching. Um, if you've made it this far, then you might want to consider subscribing to my channel um, so you don't miss what I have coming next. Uh, please do like, uh, share this video. Um, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.